In these videos, our goal is to set up Android Studio so you can start building your own Android apps. I'll walk you through the installation process and I'll do a tour of Android Studio while sharing some tips that will help you succeed. The reason Android Studio is important is because as an Android developer, you're going to spend most of your time in Android Studio. You'll use it for writing the code for your app, debugging your code, and turning the code you write into a running app. That's why you'll sometimes hear Android Studio referred to as an IDE, or Integrated Development Environment, since it combines various development tools such as your text editor, terminal, and debugger, all in one application. Because Android Studio is so central to building apps for Android, becoming familiar with it will pay dividends and save you lots of time and frustration in the future. Let's start with a bit of background so we're on the same page. Android is a mobile operating system that came out in 2008, developed by Google. Google has made Android Studio available for every major computer operating system, including Mac, Windows, and Linux. Let's get into it. Navigate to developer.android.com slash studio, which is where we'll download Android Studio. As of the time of this recording, the latest stable version of Android Studio is 3.5.3, .3, but that'll change in the future. The cool thing about Android Studio is that it's constantly being improved by the team at Google. Start the download by clicking on the button. Read through the terms and agreements and then tap on the confirmation. This download might take a while because the file is pretty large. After it's done downloading, set up Android Studio with all the default options. If you go to developer.android.com slash studio slash install, you'll see what this looks like based on the kind of computer you have. Once you're done with that, come back to this video and we'll create a new project. Hey, welcome back. At this point, you should have Android Studio fully set up, so you should be seeing something similar to what you're seeing here. I want to spend most of this video talking about the different parts of Android Studio. But in order to do so, we first need to create a project. I'll tap on the Create New Project option. First, Android Studio will ask you which template you want to start your project with, and we'll select Empty Activity. You can think of an activity like a screen in your app. So selecting this option, we'll start our app with a single empty screen. Next, we'll choose a name for our project. I'll call mine Studio Study. The name we pick will be shown in the action bar at the top of our application, and it's also used to decide something called the package name. The package name indicates the directory structure so that files in your app can be uniquely identified. It doesn't matter what it is, but the convention I suggest to most students is to take your email address and flip it. For example, my package name might become edu.stanford.rkpande followed by our app name. Select the language of Kotlin. You can build Android apps with either Kotlin or Java. And in general, Kotlin is preferred since it's a more modern and powerful language. Finally, select the minimum API version that can run the app you're building. The trade-off here is that by setting a lower value, your app will run on more devices, but you may face some complexity with backwards compatibility, since some functionality that you can do on a newer phone may not be available on older phones. You can always change this later, so I recommend selecting API 21, which is Lollipop, an Android operating system that came out in 2014. And you can see that around 85% of Android devices are on Lollipop or higher. Now just tap on Finish, and Android Studio will set up your project. What's happening here is Android Studio is pulling in all the dependencies for our project and also indexing everything so all the files can be searched and modified easily later on. Keep in mind that we're not running the project yet, we're just building it. So actually running this application on emulator will happen later on. Right, now the project is set up and we're looking at the main interface for Android Studio. Take a moment to study the different components on the screen. There are a ton of different widgets in Android Studio, and that can be overwhelming, but there are really only four or five that you'll use the most, and that's what I want to focus on. First is the project window, which allows us to easily see files in our project. You can toggle its visibility by either tapping on the project tab on the toolbar or the button over here. You can also resize the project window by dragging the border. The other part of Android Studio, which takes up the most screen real estate, is the editor window, where you'll write code. So this is a tabbed interface where there's one tab dedicated to each file and you can select them and modify them as you choose. But going back to the project window, the view that I prefer is actually the Android view because this is how conceptually Android developers will think about their project. This is optimized for accessing the key project files. 
There are four groups of files that we'll talk about here, starting with manifests. Every app must have a manifest, which declares things like permissions and how many screens your app has. So you can see we have one screen or one activity in our Android manifest that was generated for us. The next section inside of app is Java, which contains the source code, including Kotlin code. So don't get confused. It says Java, but the directories will contain your code regardless of whether they're written in Kotlin or Java. And you also have two directories here for testing. Next is a folder called res, which stands for resources, and it contains all of the non-code resources for your project, XML layouts, strings, and images. Finally, there's also a section here for Gradle scripts. Gradle is a build system, and Gradle files are basically instructions for how to take all of the source code and app resources of your application and turn them into something which actually runs on your phone. I mentioned in the resources folder, we have non-code resources such as XML layouts. These are important because they'll define the UI for our app. And there's another way to create them aside from normal text editing. In order to show you that, we have activity main.xml open here. I'll make it bigger by double tapping on the tab so all the other windows are minimized. Here you can see that we have our empty activity or empty screen, and it just has some dummy text in here called hello world. In Android, you can create layouts graphically, which is the interface that we're looking at here, or you can check out the raw XML by tapping on this button at the bottom called text. So we're looking at the design tab currently. And if I go into the text tab, you can see that there is an underlying XML representation of our UI. The important thing here is that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the design tab and the text tab. So for example, if I change the text here from hello world to hi, I save it. And now I go back into the design tab. You can see that it got updated immediately. Now, usually when I'm building the UI for my app, I'll use the design tab to drag out the different widgets I want in my screen. And then to make fine tune changes, I'll go into the text tab and then modify the XML appropriately. For now, I'll undo that and just leave the one text view or label we already had. Right, before running our application, there's one more thing I want to point out that may be easy to gloss over if you're new to Android Studio. If any file in the editor window has a red underline, that means that there's an error in the file and the project won't compile. You'll get a build error. So a really common reason for this is failing to add imports. So I can start adding a log statement here, for example, in the onCreate method. I can say log.i, pass in a tag. So a lot of students will stop here because this is technically correct. That's the right way to write a log statement. But you can now see that there's a red underline in the main activity. And if you look in the right side, you'll also see where in the file this error is coming from. And the issue it says is unresolved reference log. So what you need to make sure is add the import into the file. So the way you can do this is have Android Studio help you with this by hovering over. For a Mac, all I need to do is say option enter. And what that did is it added one more line in the set of imports at the top of the file. And now there's no more errors and I should be able to successfully build and run this app. Now that we've walked through the basics of Android Studio, I'd like to run the application. As you develop apps, you'll of course want to test them out. You can either do this on a real phone or on an emulator, which is a way to start a virtual Android device on your computer. I recommend using an emulator because then you won't have to deal with putting your phone in developer mode and finding a cable to connect it to your computer. And the benefit of an emulator is that you get more flexibility to try out your app on phones of different screen sizes or API versions. This green arrow at the top is how we're going to build and run our application. But before doing that, you'll need to have an emulator. Go to the dropdown next to that green arrow icon and open AVD Manager. AVD Manager stands for Android Virtual Device Manager. If this is your first time with Android Studio, you won't see any devices here. So tap on Create Virtual Device. You can go through the options here to select which kind of phone you want to emulate. So I recommend having one modern phone and one older phone just to see the spectrum of how your app looks on different screens and different screen sizes. So I'll just go through the defaults here. I'll say pixel two. Here you need to select a system image. If you don't have one, then you need to download one, but this will dictate what is the API level for that phone. And finally here, you can select a name for your Android virtual device, select a default orientation, and there's a couple other advanced settings, but for the most part, you should be fine just going with the default. So what you should do is tap on finish, but I'm going to cancel because I already have a bunch of virtual devices. Now we'll boot up an emulator by tapping on the green arrow icon. 
and pay attention to the bottom of Android Studio, the status bar, which will tell you when the emulator is fully booted up. For the most part, this is like a normal phone. If you're not familiar with Android, spend a few minutes to play around with the emulator and see how you can rotate the phone or go back. So you have normal apps on the home screen. You can drag up to see all the apps. You can drag down to see settings and so on. When we run the app, we'll actually have one more icon, one more app icon in this emulator, and that'll be our entry point into the app. So now that we have an emulator running, let me close the virtual device manager and let me tap on this green arrow icon to run our application. And again, this status bar at the bottom of Android Studio will tell you when it's actually deployed onto your emulator. So here you can see that I got deployed and just as we expected, we see our layout which says hi. So interestingly, I find that students will more often get stuck setting up their emulator compared to setting up Android Studio. So I'll leave a link in the description for troubleshooting common issues with the emulator. Now that we have an app running on an emulator, I want to talk about two more important parts of Android Studio to finish up our tour. First is the Logcat tab. So this is at the bottom toolbar. Looking at logs of your app is really important because this is how you can understand what's actually happening. And that's what the Logcat tab will allow you to do. The first drop down here allows you to select which device you want to look at logs from. We only have one device connected to our computer, which is an emulator, so that's what we'll pick. The next drop down will allow you to pick which application do you want to view logs from. So you can actually see there's package names representing all the other apps that are on this device. Almost always, I'll keep this on the app that I'm actually developing for. So in our case, this is the Studio Study app. Finally, this drop down is to indicate the minimum level for what logs you want to see. So everything is ordered. Um, verbose is the lowest severity level, then debug, info, warning, error, and asserts. So by selecting verbose, we're saying that I want to see all the logs. And if I bring this up to info, that means I only want to see info level logs or higher. You'll notice that there's logs that we wrote here along with a bunch of logs that we never wrote. And these are just coming from the system. So in particular, you can see that the log that we wrote inside the onCreate method does show up. And the other cool thing you can do is filter for logs based on a certain message. So usually inside of one class, the tag will always be the same. And so if I, if I wanted to search for that tag, I could do that. And now we can only see the log message that we expect. And finally, one other thing you want to make sure is in this last drop down, you have show only selected application. Because if you have no filters, you all should be seeing logs from all apps on the device, which will get really confusing. Second is the build tab. So the build tab is useful if you encounter errors when you try to deploy your app. For example, some students don't realize that XML attributes are case sensitive. So if I go into the text tab, and let's say I change this to be capital text, and I try running the app now. Now the build tab will automatically pop up and you'll see an error. Android Studio is telling us exactly where the issue was, activity underscore main.xml line nine. So it's referring to this text view and it's something called AAPT attribute Android text not found. And so if you tap either here or if you tap on the file pointer, it'll put you there and then you can try and fix the error. So having some familiarity with the build tab will make sure that you're actually deploying your app correctly. So now if we run the app, we should again see the app boot up on the emulator. Finally, I'd like to leave you with four practical tips based on the experience from past students. A lot of these are coming from my friend Karen at CodePath, who's done a lot of great work in this area already. So I'll leave a link to her slides in the description. The first tip is to make sure that you know when your app has been successfully deployed. A lot of students will get frustrated that the app is not reflecting their changes properly. But the issue is simply that the changes aren't even being deployed to the phone or emulator. So when you click on the Run button in Android Studio, you'll see a status bar at the bottom of Android Studio indicating the build progress. When that finishes, check your emulator to make sure that the app that you built is actually coming up and being restarted. Sometimes I found that it's helpful to deliberately introduce an error to make sure that the project actually fails. That way you can tell that the changes you're making are having an effect. The second tip is use autocomplete. Autocomplete is a really powerful feature in Android Studio. It'll not only help you reduce typos, but you can also learn what options are available. For example, if we added a button into our project, you might want to set a click listener so you take some action when the user taps on that button. So if you just start typing set on click listener, you can see that Android Studio will help you fill out the rest. 
and you can also see the documentation in line. This is really helpful not only to learn, but also to make sure that you're much more efficient with your coding. Third, there are a ton of keyboard shortcuts that you'll learn as you spend more time in Android Studio. The only one that I, re that I recommend you remember right now is double pressing the shift key. At any time, you can search across source code, shortcuts, UI elements, and more by typing shift shift. For example, opening a file is a really common action. So I can start typing file in a search, and that will tell me the shortcut is command shift O or control shift N for Windows. Now that I see that, in the future, I can use the shortcut directly rather than relying on double shift. Once you've been developing for a few months, you'll find that you'll naturally have picked up dozens of keyboard shortcuts. And finally, start clean. The last tip is to simply restart things. Both Android Studio and the emulator are really complex pieces of software and they have bugs. So if you're encountering a really weird error that seems unrelated to your changes, restart Android Studio and restart the emulator and see if that'll fix it. Another tip is to go into the file menu and then tap on invalidate caches or restart. And then another thing you can try is go into build and clean your project. Basically the idea is whatever bad state your build or your project might have been in, clean that and then start again and see if that fixes the issue. That's it in terms of the most important pieces of Android Studio. As a review, we talked about the project window to navigate important files, the editor window to create and modify code, the toolbar at the top is how you run your app, and the toolbar at the bottom contains the logcat and build tab, which are useful for diagnosing what's happening when your app is running. I hope you feel more comfortable with Android Studio now. Let me know if you have any questions or tips to share. Don't forget to like and subscribe if this was helpful, and I'll see you in the next one.